Hashan, some of the I have I have done the opposite. I wear the red suit and the have no competition. And in some of the suitors, some students approach the Buddha. And the Buddha is very harsh with them. Uh, sometimes some uh, vehicle has a certain idea, uh, which is a wrong view according to the Buddha. And the Buddha admonishes him, is harsh with him, and uh, maybe puts a uh, shade on the student. And uh, when I when I read it, I was feeling that uh, that uh, the Buddha um, promotes um, people to be not so uh, caring towards another person. So what is your conclusion? So I would like to uh, respond to that. Uh, can you quote me the sutta? Yes. One sutta that comes into mind is that a certain, uh, a certain vehicle uh, has an idea that the Buddha teaches about a certain self, a certain self which is more subtle. And he talks a bit about us and the other uh, students. And the students, the other students go to the Buddha. Uh, and, uh, and the Buddha then admonishes him, uh, him very, very harshly. You, you should be known for this bad, harmful view, not I. And then another Buddha, uh, which I remember is that somebody who uh, lets uh, take the rope and not taking his rope off and going to uh, out of uh, the big life, becoming a lay person, going to his village or something like that. So he uh, we have criticism and uh, telling his opinions to other people uh, and, and criticizing the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha's teaching, and when the Buddha talks, I think, to Sariputta about it, he's very harsh about it. And he says, This person, a person who talks about me, the Buddha, that I'm compassionate. Find his way to hell, just as the leaf finds his way to hell. That's so you think the Buddha is not compassionate? No, I do not say I want to. <laughs> Actually, in like. This is something that I think could be maybe understood wrongly. Maybe I understood it wrongly as well, but I would like to. You know, sometimes we judge a person from our own point of view, from our own standard. But uh, you should be very careful because uh, um, the Buddha said that a person of inferior wisdom cannot judge a person of uh, higher wisdom. But a person with a higher wisdom can judge a person with a lower wisdom. So sometimes the Buddha uses harsh words, but uh, actually because harsh words are, are, are needed. So for example, this monk who had this wrong view about the self, he was saying what the, what the Buddha did not say. He was misrepresenting the Buddha's teaching. And because of his wrong view, he would be, if he carried this wrong view with him, he would go to the woeful plains of rebirth. So the Buddha wanted him to understand. That's why the Buddha used harsh words. 
just like sometimes, you know, the Buddha said, no, sometimes you use the soft approach. And if the soft approach doesn't work, then you need to use the hard, hard approach. And uh, maybe all, maybe also the soft and hard approach. Mm. So, um, speaking to somebody harshly sometimes is uh, necessary to wake him up. It's not necessary that uh, using harsh words is uh, not compassionate. The, the Buddha, in fact, all Aryans speak very plainly. Uh, Aryans never uh, sweeten their words. The Buddha said that uh, if something deserves praise, we should praise it. And if something deserves dispraise, we should dispraise it. We don't think of uh, speaking politically correct words. That's why you find uh, uh, the Buddha talks very plain. And For example, uh, when Devadatta, he broke off from the Sangha, started his own Sangha, then the Buddha asks uh, Sariputta and Mughalana to go and inform the lay people whatever Devadatta says and does, nothing to do with the Buddha. So they went around and, and did this. So you could say that they are bad-mouthing Devadatta, but uh, they're, they're saying the, 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 the truth. And it's for a good reason that the Buddha asked them to go and say this, so not to damage this, the reputation of the Sangha, and not to, to, to mislead people. So sometimes harsh words are necessary. As they say, you need, sometimes you need to be cruel to be kind. Okay? After I came to Theravada Buddhism, because I was so disappointed with my first teacher, I was not eager to look for a teacher. And also partly because I came into monkhood at the age of 35, uh, I gave up um, an engineer's life to become a monk. So I, I felt that uh, I really want to practice. So for the first 10 years after I became a Theravada monk, I live uh, alone most of the time. I like to live in caves for two reasons. Two reasons. In Malaysia, if you live in a cave, it's cool. It's outside can be very hot. Uh, and secondly, if you live in a cave, it cuts off the outside noise. You don't hear the traffic and all that. Mm. But uh, you need a lot of discipline if you want to live alone. Because uh, we have this cave on Penang Hill. That I stayed about seven years alone. And uh, after I left the place, I allowed other monks to use it. But I found that some monks are not suited to staying alone. When they stay alone, they sleep a lot. <laughs> you can see from their eyes. <laughs> and some, they live alone, they get uh, all kinds of thoughts and you know, become very restless. And although they're supposed to be staying in that cave, they wander here, wander there, and come back to the cave, and again go here and go there. So you need a lot of discipline to be able to live alone. And uh, from the suttas, we find actually that you need a bit of samadhi before the Buddha allowed his disciples to go off to live alone. So like you stay in a monastery like this, you have to be able to practice First, if you can't practice here, it's difficult for you to, to, to go off alone and practice. So you need to make progress in your meditation in a place like this, even in, uh, amidst so, much, so many people, with so much to do. Whenever you can find the time, you, you practice. Mm. 
The other thing is, uh, the Buddha said that his monks must follow a teacher for at least five years before they are allowed to go off on their own. Now, to me, these five years basically is to learn the suttas and the vinaya. We don't have a good grounding of the suttas and the vinaya. If you go off alone, you might your vinaya is no good. You might misbehave. If your sutta is no good, you might go the wrong way and you don't know. So it's very important to have a good grounding on the suttas and the vinaya. When I stayed alone, I had some interesting experience just to uh, entertain you. <laughs> I um, I came to Thailand in 1986, early 86, and I stayed almost the whole year in Thailand, 1986. And I spent some time in a cave monastery in uh, Ratchaburi. Uh, there's this hill, about 200 feet. At the top of the hill, there's a little opening. The light comes in about 10 o'clock in the morning. And after 2, 2 p.m., it gets dark. The cave gets dark again. And you got to walk halfway up the hill. And then you go into an opening. And then you walk into the belly and the... the heart of the of the of the cave and uh, even when I first went there I was told that you have big pythons there big as your thigh so one night when I was staying there sleeping on a on a bed which was maybe as high as this and it was in a narrow passage and this passage uh, uh, beside the bed you could you know uh, for walking maybe three or four feet and one night about 3 a.m. this Big snake came crawling back. Maybe he had just eaten a goat or something. So I heard it crawling beside me. The way it crawled, you know it's a big snake. Why? Because it dragged its body and stopped. Dragged its body and stopped. <laughs> a normal snake would just glide, you know. But this fellow, you can sense that it's very heavy. <laughs> I dare not look. I dare not shine the torch. No, big snakes, if you shine the torch, you'll come up. <laughs> That's an interesting experience. Then, uh, 1987, when I came back to Malaysia, I wanted to find a cave to stay. So Ipoh area is famous for caves. So I went to look for caves, but most of the good caves were taken up by fortune tellers, <laughs> by monks and all that. So this old monk, he got his devotees to look. For me, actually, this old monk is a is a Thai monk of uh, Chinese descent, but he lived about twenty five years in uh, Ipoh before he came back to Thailand. So he helped me look for this uh, cave, and then they found me a dark cave, <laughs> very dark, cave. big but dark. So I was a bit afraid, not used to uh, staying in a dark place all by myself, you know. When I was young, I used to see this uh, horrible uh, empire <laughs> pictures, you know, movies, and I got really scared of dark places. So the uh, to enter this cave, you have to sort of put your put your head down and go inside. And then on the other side, there's another opening, but it's surrounded by bushes and all that. And uh, every morning, there's an old man and the wife who go through this cave and plant veggie on the other side because uh, people can, can cannot come to steal his vegetables. You know, it's, it's quite uh, secluded. So when I first went to, went to this cave, it was so dark. I was afraid of uh, staying inside. So I stayed at the other opening, where there's a bigger opening, and uh, there was an elevated place. So I stayed there uh, the first day, first night I stayed there, and then, uh, then I realized that uh, it was not ideal because uh, during the daytime, the heat, you can start to feel the heat, and also you can hear the traffic outside. I thought of going inside to stay, but I was afraid. The second night, I had an interesting dream. Actually, this cave also is a hill. I dreamt that this hill, there are about four or five devas living on this hill. So I was sleeping there. They were looking at me, you know, 
these devas. And I looked at them. Uh, three or four were standing, and the leader was seated. And they were all wearing these uh, deva clothes, like Indians, you know, Indian deva clothes. And uh, they, they were very handsome. And I, I looked at them. The leader was different from the others. The, the others, you, you know, you have a normal head with eyes and uh, nose and all that. But this leader, the face was just a uh, light, just glowing light. Mm. So I was, I was seeing, I was looking at them. I was quite impressed with them. Then because they were looking at me, I looked at myself. Then I found I was just like them, Deva. Then suddenly I woke up. Then I realized they were trying to tell me that they accepted me as a member. And that I could stay in the cave and it would be safe. <laughs> so I went inside and stayed in the cave for four months. And I, I'd go to the village for arms round. But these people had never seen a monk on arms round. They only know monks who go for, for money round. <laughs> so when I walked to the market, Everybody stared at me as though I was an orang utan just come out from the zoo. <laughs> they didn't know how to give me food. So I thought if I keep walking, nobody's going to give me any food. So I went to the stalls where this this whole food. You know. I passed the noodle stall, nobody gave me. I passed the rice stall, nobody gave me. Then there was this uh, lady selling this uh, dumplings, this uh, or this. Uh, Flour. Uh, this salapau made of, uh, you know, the flour and all that. So I, I, I decided I'll stand in front of a stall so that she might give me something. Even I stood in front of a stall also, she didn't know what, what I wanted. And the customer told her, uh, he wants some food, I'll give him. So then she, she gave me some. Uh, to my bowl. I walked to the next store. They gave me some more. And then I was about to walk to the third store. The, the first lady came running to me with some money in her hand. So I closed my bowl. I said, we don't accept. <laughs> then uh, then I, I continued walking. That's all I, I, I had to eat, you know, these, uh, these uh, dumplings. Second day I came. Also... I walked slowly and then they gave me this dumpling. So, third day, I decided I'm not going to stop. I just walked slowly and then they came and gave me dumplings. The fourth day, I ate dumplings. The fifth day, I ate dumplings. The sixth day, ten days, I had to eat dumplings. <laughs> and then uh, some of these uh, people were curious, you know, they thought the uh, news was going around. There's a Thai monk in the cave. So, some people came to visit me. Then I explained to them that uh, I wasn't a Mahayana monk. Uh, we monks who beg for their food are not vegetarians. And then the next day I got some rice. <laughs> uh, just, uh, just to amuse you again, another incident in uh, Penang Hill, that cave uh, where I stayed for seven years. It was actually earlier developed by another monk, but he never stayed long there. So when I first went to stay there, it had, been, it had not been used for some time. So normally when I go to stay in a new place or a cave, I'll just pray to all the devas and pay respect to them and tell them, come here to practice, not to take your place. So please uh, don't uh, have any ill feelings toward me and uh, don't show yourself. <laughs> so that night when I slept, just I was, just as I was about to doze off, you know, when you're about to doze off, your body is uh, all soft and listless, and your mind is starting to, to go to sleep. Then this little elf came and pulled my ear. <laughs> then I woke up. Then I, I told him, I said, uh, "Please uh, don't disturb me. You know, I didn't, I didn't come here to take your place. You can stay. You know, we just share the place." And then he didn't disturb me anymore. And the next night, when I was just about to fall asleep again, he came and pulled my nose. <laughs> and again, I said the thing, same thing to him. Third night, again, he came and pulled my ear or something. 
Four nine again he did. I was getting angry. <laughs> and the next night when I fell asleep, just about to fall asleep, he came. I gave him a punch. <laughs> I, I could sense him quietly going away. No more disturbance after that. So like the Buddha said, if you use a soft approach, it doesn't work, you need a hard approach. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. I think he said that uh, if you have unshakable faith in the Buddha, unshakable faith in the Dhamma, unshakable faith in the Sangha, and you have a perfect sila or Aryan sila, uh, then you can say that you have uh, attained stream entry. Yeah. Mm. But this uh, unshakable faith in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, it's hard to, hard to gauge actually. And then this, uh, this Aryan Sila, perfect Sila, what, what is uh, Aryan Sila, perfect Sila? It's not the 227 precepts. It's not the eight precepts. In the Noble Eightfold Path, you look at the uh, sila component, consists of three factors, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Right speech consists of four precepts, right? Not to lie, not to carry tales and cause disharmony, not to engage in cause or vulgar speech, and not to engage in idle gossip. So there are four precepts. Right action consists of three precepts, not to kill, not to take what is not given, and not to engage in sexual misconduct. Right livelihood is uh, earning a livelihood without harming others, and it is actually covered by the right speech and right action. So actually, Aryan Sila consists of seven precepts, seven precepts. If you hold the seven precepts well, then yeah, you have the basic condition to become an Arya. Because uh, without sila, if you break sila, then you have remorse. And if you have remorse, your mind can never be happy. Your mind can never, if it's not happy, your mind cannot calm down. You need a happy mind to actually meditate. So actually, a lot of people, they are not ready to, to meditate. They need to do more good, help others, and then be glad with yourself, not be angry with yourself. You know, there are a lot of people uh, angry with themselves. They may not realize it. A lot of people hate themselves. People who go into depression, people who try to kill themselves. Well, they are not happy people. If you are not happy, you cannot meditate. The Buddha's disciples were not like external ascetics. There's one sutta where it is mentioned that the Buddha's disciples are always smiling and cheerful. <laughs> I like the, the, some of the uh, external ascetics. Mm-hmm. So if you are practicing the right meditation, you should be happy and cheerful, uh, not thinking of dukkha all the time. <laughs> so if you want to gauge whether you have uh, entered the stream. Uh, one way is whether you are familiar with the suttas. Secondly is whether you are willing to let go. But there's actually a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. I'm not sure. I think it's 48 where uh, the qualities of a sotapanna are spelled out very clearly. It's the only place where the qualities of a Suttapanna are spelled out very clearly. You can look into that sutta. The other thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, many of us like um, we read a lot of the, or listen to a lot of the teachings of Ajahn Chah. Mm. Can you build a bridge to, to the approach of the like of you studying the sources and us living like in this kind of um, Tradition of um, hearing words from a, from a teacher which we have respect. Yes. Particularly, 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
right way. He must end up with samadhi, namely the jhanas. If he de- practices satipatthana the incorrect way, he will not attain the jhanas. Mm. So this is very important. If you practice satipatthana must end up with the jhanas. That is why in the, I think, Anapanasati Sutta, they stated that when you practice Anapanasati, uh, unremitting mindfulness on the breath, you are practicing, you are perfecting the, the four satipatthana. Yeah? You investigate the sutta. The other thing. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'd like to go with the call of the Nabiya. Thank you very much, Patrick.